This morning we are continuing our series in the book of Daniel. And this has been an interesting week for me. I was in the, the south of Brazil in a city called Porto Alegre. And we were, we were doing some teaching for, for church planners. And I realized I had to prepare a message for Sunday. And normally I prepare my messages somewhat ahead of time. Not always, but somewhat. And I opened up the text once again, and I saw, wow, this is not going to be so easy. <laughs> We're dealing with one of the most challenging chapters, I think, that I've dealt with since I've been teaching, for various reasons. But I think it's something that we do need to understand if we want to understand the Bible, if we want to understand the end times, if we want to understand prophecy. So it's Daniel chapter 7. The scene is Babylon, and the year is about 500 before Christ. God's people have been brought into captivity, including Daniel. And what we've seen over the first six chapters is that six kings have come, and six kings have gone. One kingdom has come, fallen, and another kingdom has risen up in its place. And through it all, as we talked about last week, Daniel was faithful and Daniel was steadfast. Remember that? Daniel was fair for me, Ephiel. And so for the first six chapters of the book of Daniel, it's been pretty easy for us to kind of understand what's been going on. But honestly, all of that changes today. All of that changes today. Because up to this point, it's been all about stories. A story about Daniel and three other young men who purposed in their heart that they would not contaminate themselves with the king's delicacies. You remember that story? And they ate, only, they ate only fruits and vegetables for 10 days, and their appearance was better than all the rest of the young guys. Then we heard the story about Daniel who interpreted the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar successfully. Then we, we heard another story of another dream that the king had, and Daniel interpreted it and, and the king, as a result, actually was redeemed. Then we heard another story about another king who had a huge festa, a huge party, King Belshazzar, and whose pride led to a great fall. Then we heard another story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were faced in front of the, in front of the furnace, and they said, we don't, it doesn't matter to us what's going to happen, we're going to be faithful to our God. And then last week, we saw what was kind of the climax of the book of Daniel and the most famous story of Daniel before the lion's den and how he had complete faith and trust in his father. He was faithful and he was steadfast, and the Lord responded miraculously. So these stories build our faith and they encourage us. They really show us courage in the midst of difficulties. And they're not just stories, they really are real happenings. They're, they're examples of real faithful men, an example of a real and faithful God. But we get into set, chapter 7 and everything just kind of gets weird. The tone of the book is completely different. The focus is completely different. It, it's almost like set, chapter 7 and 12 aren't even the same book what, whatsoever. It's almost so different that it doesn't even seem like it's the same book in the Bible. And so the first six chapters of Daniel are a lot of history with a little bit of prophecy. And the second six chapters are a lot of prophecy with just a little bit of history. So we're going to take a look at chapter 7 today. And to be honest, I'm not sure we're going to go through the rest of this book as we did through the first six chapters, verse by verse. We're probably not. We're going to look at chapter 7 today. Probably in a couple weeks, we're going to look at chapter 9. And then we're going to look at chapter 12, and that's probably going to be our study in the book of Daniel, three more weeks in this book, because there's so much, there's so much prophecy and so much about dreams that I don't want to spend a lot of time speculating on things that we really aren't sure about. I'm not sure it's that edifying for us. I'm not saying the word isn't edifying. The word is edifying, but it's also edifying for us to, to figure out what's the best thing to preach on at the right time for our body, right? So we're going to spend a couple more weeks, probably in the book of Daniel, just to finish out. But this, what we're about to talk about today, is important to help you understand a lot about the importance of this book to the rest of the Bible. 
Now, as Christians, we need to know what we believe and why we believe it. Would you agree with me? We as Christians, we need to know what we believe and why we believe it. So when we say the Bible is the word of God, we are saying that the entire scriptures are the inerrant, infallible word of God. And that includes difficult parts like chapter 7 of Daniel. And so we need to go deeper in our faith. We need to be more educated as, as believers so that we can stand up for what we believe because chapters like this cause people to sometimes question the Bible. Years ago, there was a famous theologian. His name was Carl Henry. And when he was a student, he was on a university campus with a group outside. And he was giving his testimony to this group of, of university students about why he believed in Christ and why he valued the scriptures. And sort of in this group, there was a young man who was a skeptic, and he started to interrupt Carl all the time, and it got kind of annoying. Carl was just trying to share his testimony, and the young skeptic kept interrupting him. And finally, the young guy said to Carl, let me just ask you a simple question. Do you really believe in this book that you're holding, the Bible? Do you really believe in this book? I mean, do you really believe all the stories in the Bible? Do you believe, for example, the story of Jonah and the whale? You believe in the creation story? You believe in all that stuff? And Carl Henry said, yes, I believe in all of it. I believe in all the word of the Lord. And so the man went on trying to disrupt him in his logic. And the young man said, well, let me ask you a question. How could a guy like Jonah survive in the belly of a whale, in the stomach of a great fish or a whale, as the Bible says, with all the gastric juices emanating, with oxygen deprivation as part of the problem, with all the gases from the alimentary canal, how on earth could Jonah survive? It's a good question, isn't it? And the young Carl Henry said, Sir, I don't know the answer to your question, but when I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah. And so the skeptic said to him, Yeah, but what if Jonah isn't in heaven? What if he's not in heaven? Then Henry said, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> now, we know that that's not always the right way to handle skeptics, right? That's a little crude. But we as Christians, we need to understand that our God is a miracle-working God, and not everyone's going to understand that. How, how many of us have experienced the miracle of God in our lives? I think many of us have. I've seen miracles in my life, and the greatest miracle, of course, is salvation, right? Our God is a God of miracle, and so if we don't believe that God has the capacity to perform miracles, we actually don't even believe in the resurrection, because it really was, the resurrection was the greatest miracle of all, right? So we know that God is a miracle-working God, and it's just not about ignoring science, it's about it's, a, it's about admitting that there is a God who created science. We either trust and we have faith in God, or we don't. And the same could be said about Scripture, right? Because we begin to see many things happening here in chapter 7 of Daniel. And the cool thing about the prophecies of the, of the Old Testament is that many of them have been fulfilled already. The hard part for us to understand is, is what prophecies were primarily before the time of Christ and what prophecies were more for the end times or in the middle there. Just an example, in Daniel chapter 11, there are 35 verses that actually have 135 prophetic elements, 135 prophecies fulfilled in Daniel chapter 11, and just 35 verses. That's pretty incredible if you think about it. The chances of that happening are statistically one in a billion. And so what we see in chapter 7, in one aspect, is kind of simple to explain. Daniel saw things, he saw visions, he had a dream, he wrote down what he saw, and what Daniel saw and wrote down happened as time went on. And so that's what we're going to look at here in chapter 7. Let's stand as we read chapter, the entirety of chapter 7 this morning. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed, and he wrote down the substance of the dream. Daniel said, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me were four winds of heaven churning up the great sea, four great beasts, each one different from the others that came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and they had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground, so it stood on two feet like a human being, and the mind of a human was given to it. 
And then before me, there was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides and has three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that, I looked up and there was another beast that looked like a shepherd. And on its back, it had four wings like those of a bird. And it had four heads and was given authority to rule. After that, I looked up, or after that in my vision at night, I looked and before me, there was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the other beasts. It has 10 horns. It had 10 horns. And when I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them. And three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eye of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I looked, thrones were set in place and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire and his wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. A court was seated and the books were open. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and his body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but they were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds in heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped with him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the meaning of all this, and he told me the interpretation. The four beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth. But the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, forever and ever. Then I want to know the meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others and most terrifying, with its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that had crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. And I also want to know about the ten horns on his head and the other horn that came up before the three of them fell, the horn that looked more imposing than the others, and eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High, and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. And it gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on the earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are the ten kings who will come from the kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones, and he will subdue the three kings. He will speak against the Most High, oppress the holy people, and try to change the set times and laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times, and half a time. But the court will sit, and its power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the all kingdoms of their heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be a everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. This is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts. My face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. This is the word of the Lord this morning. Amen? Amen. You may be seated. So, this morning, I don't have any stories. I don't have a lot of analogies. We're just going to get right into the text. Okay? Chapter 7 is a prophetic panorama of what happens from the time of Daniel through history until Jesus Christ comes back in a very compressed form. Chapter 7 is a panoramic view, and this is important because chapters 8 through 12 all take portions of chapter 7 and kind of expand upon it or highlight it, highlight various elements of it. So basically, Daniel sees four beasts that come out of the earth. These are four world empires. Just like the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had in chapter 2. There's a lot of similarities with the dream. Most theologians believe that God gave a similar dream to Daniel purposely. But either way, the main theme of the, that's not necessarily the main theme of the, the, the chapter. The main theme of the chapter is not even really about these three kingdoms before the last kingdom. The main theme of the chapter is the kingdom of God through his son, Jesus Christ. 
the kingdom of all, all of our kingdoms. The main theme of chapter 7 is that all of human history culminates when God the Father gives to God the Son his everlasting kingdom. Now maybe you don't know this, but Daniel 7 is one of the most important chapters in terms of being referenced by those in the New Testament. For example, it's considered a passage of primary reference because Paul the Apostle John the Apostle and Jesus Christ himself, all of them look backwards from the New Testament into Daniel chapter 7 and they reference it. Jesus actually referred to Daniel as Daniel the prophet. So Daniel was definitely a prophet. And Daniel's vision of the future is of these four world governing kingdoms that will begin in his day and they go onward. Beginning with what is the Babylonian Empire, then the Medo-Persian Empire, followed by the Grecian Empire, and followed by the Roman Empire. Now, there's a lot of speculation about these empires. When did they start? When did they end? There's all kinds of speculation. If you just put in, in, in Google, like, what were these empires, you're going to get a million things. You're going to get, like, the Catholic Church was a part of this. You're going to get... Uh, Alexander the Great. I mean, there's all different kinds of references, and I think some of them make some sense, but the, the, the closer we get to the end times in terms of the references, the more it gets a little skewy. It doesn't really make a lot of sense because then you're like, well, it was Hitler, and then it was, you know, some people say it was like Trump, and then it's Obama, and then it's Lula. People just kind of start to lose their mind a little bit <laughs> when they talk about who may be the ultimate Antichrist and all that kind of thing, right? But this has to do with the empires. We're going to get in a minute to this idea of the Antichrist. So let's look at the four, these four in detail. Because there's the lion, there's the bear, there's the leopard, and then there's the fourth beast. So the lion. The lion had eagle's wings, but the weird thing is, is that they were plucked off while Daniel was looking. The winged lion had been the winged lion has been found in actually in excavations made in cities of ancient Babylon, symbolizing the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, his might and his conquests. The bear was a formidable beast. This is the second. And the bear was strong, cruel, and cunning. This was a fitting symbol of the Medo Persian Empire, which, if you remember, was the empire that took over when King Belshazzar was cap captured. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. This strange feature is described by Daniel is that there were three ribs in the bear's mouth between its teeth, perhaps depicting the empire feeding in its captive nations and cruelty and in, in humanity. And if we consider the wars of the century, nothing has changed, right? So you guys, you guys with me here? First is Babylonian. Then we even saw in Daniel how it moved into that second empire. Then we have the leopard, which is an appropriate image for the Grecian empire. Alexander the Great, its founder, extended its territory rapidly, reaching India in its conquest. The leopard has four heads, and this is considered by some theologians as meaning the division of the kingdom into four as Alexander's early death when his, gen when his generals uh, actually uh, uh, divided the empire into four different quarters. And so you can imagine that this fearful drama is kind of playing out before Daniel's eyes and it becomes more and more horrible the more that you like, listen to the story. As each succeeding beast becomes more cruel and becomes more of a monster than his predecessor. It's like a bad horror movie, basically, before his eyes. And so the final fourth beast was not given a name, only a description. Terrifying, frightening, powerful, large iron teeth. The behavior of this beast became so cruel and so savage that it could not be compared with any of the other animals. This beast devoured its victims broke them in pieces. Most people believe that this is a de de depiction of the Roman Empire, but frankly, it really doesn't matter because the details of this vision, while it's tempting to speculate, is not as important as the broad truths that it contains. So what does this vision mean to us so far? The kingdoms of men have come and gone, right? We talked about the different kingdoms. They've come and gone. They may have been powerful. They may have risen up to power with speed, the boundaries may have been extensive, but none of them have lasted forever because there was another more powerful, more hungry, more determined ruler that was waiting in the wings. And so Daniel receives the interpretation of the dream 
in the actual text that these beasts do represent kings and kingdoms, but the fourth beast, theoretically representing the Roman Empire, is odd because it's different than all the other ones because it seems to have an early reign and a latter reign. Are you with me? I know this may be hard for those of us who aren't native English speakers because we're going to get into some terminology that can be a little challenging. But the idea is that the empire, the Roman Empire, will somehow be resurrected or brought back in some fragmented form in the end times before the Messiah comes. But what's important about this fourth empire is that a leader emerges from it. A powerful leader that we call the Antichrist. He goes by 25 different names in the Bible, including the beast in Revelation chapter 13. But in this chapter, he's kind of called the little horn. So when we're talking about that little horn, we're talking about the Antichrist. Now let me share a little bit about it. Paul refers to the Antichrist as the man of lawlessness. In 2 Thessalonians, we read, Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day of Christ's second coming will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction. And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in this time, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. And so Paul wrote that this man of lawlessness is coming. And he says it's already at work. Now most theologians believe two important things here. First, that a distinct figure of great satanic power is coming. Secondly, that his mysterious presence can already be felt in the present time. He's already here, but yet he's not yet here. That has to do with this idea of two reigns. So the, the spirit of the Antichrist is already here, even though the figurehead is not necessarily here. So we read in 1 John 4, every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is in the world already. John Piper puts it this way, there is a future Antichrist yet to come, but the spirit of the Antichrist is already in the world. And so as we read what John wrote, we see that many Antichrists are present, but the ultimate will come one day. 1 John 2, 18, you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, so now many antichrists has come. That's what the scripture says. Again, it's now, but it's also not yet. So to put it more simply, what we read in chapter 7 is Daniel prophesying what Paul and John also wrote about. Paul and John picture a final time before the second coming when a, when, when a person of great demonic power will rise up in rebellion against the true Christ and his people. In the meantime, the satanic characteristics of that figure are already manifesting themselves in the world in some places with greater and other places lesser dominance. Once again, the Antichrist is coming, but yet in some senses he's already here. That's why the Bible says many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, such a one is the Antichrist, is what we read in 2 John chapter 1. Now, the Antichrist is depicted in Revelation chapter 6 as the rider on the white horse who comes conquering and to conquer. He comes peacefully at first because he just has a bow at the beginning, but what follows him afterwards is carnage and devastation. The Bible also says that the Antichrist will be accompanied by another who is called the false prophet. Revelation 13, 16, 19, and 20 all mention this false prophet. The false prophet is described as someone who has the appearance of a lamb but speaks like a dragon. He's going to direct the world to obey the beast, and his primary job is going to be deception. He'll be able, the Bible says, to perform miracles and to deceive people to follow the beast, which is the Antichrist. Now let's get back to Daniel. So in the middle of this nightmare concerning these terrifying beasts, there's a vision. And this vision causes him to kind of look up. And this is what we see in verses 9 and 10, a glorious prophetic word here. As I looked, the thrones were placed and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. 
His throne was fiery flames and his wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out before him and thousands upon thousands served him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were opened. Daniel's not talking about something that happened at that time. Daniel's talking about the end of times. Here's a picture of God described as the ancient of days. Here's the eternal one who is in complete control, sitting on his throne with thousands and thousands of servants attending him. No matter how terrifying any kingdom is, God not only created the kingdom, he also judges the kingdom. Nothing is out of the control of God. Nothing is beyond his justice. Nothing can change his plans. And central to his plans is someone who is called the Son of Man. The Son of Man. Look at verses 13 and 14. I saw in night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. And so, friends, human kingdoms may be strong or terrifying, like the Roman kingdom or Nazi Germany, or terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda or like the Taliban, but they are all transient. They will all be brought to justice, but the Son of Man is going to rule over them forever. Now, please note that the Son of Man is not a beast like the other images. He is human. The Son of Man in Daniel 7 is the ultimate human who will rule as King of Kings and of Lord, as Lord of Lords forever. Eighty-one times in the New Testament, just in the Gospels, we, hear the, we, we read the term Son of Man, and it was a term that refers to Jesus. It was a term that Jesus used to refer to himself, to describe himself. And the first mentioning of it is in Daniel chapter 7, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. So then, verse 13 of Daniel is teaching us about the second coming of Jesus Christ. This theme dominates the Bible, believe it or not. There's no theme discussed more in the Bible other than the subject of faith than the second coming. If you scour the Bible, there are over 1,800 references to the second coming. Jesus personally referred to the second coming 21 times, and 50 times in the Bible we're told to be ready for his second coming. So, we're not going to get into this today. The question is, when is he coming? And the other question is, how much are we going to have to suffer? Right? And that gets into questions of what we believe about the tribulation. Do we believe that we all go through the tribulation? Those who believe that consider themselves post-trib. Do we believe that we're all going to be raptured? And we're all, you know, some of us are going to be left and others are going to fly in the air, and that's pre-trib. Then there's others who think that some of this is a little bit more, let's just say, <laughs> that there's some things that we shouldn't be speculating about, and that we're going to be going through some things, but not exactly the way that the pre-trib and the post-trib have considered it. And that most people consider themselves amillennialists. And there's some good rationale for that, which I'm not going to get into today. That's actually more of my position. But we're not going to get into all that today because those conversations are important, but I think we're going to get to them in the next few chapters. What is most important for us at this time is that Jesus is going to come back, Right? When is he coming back? We don't know. Jesus himself doesn't even know, right? Jesus said, I mean, he, 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 he illustrates that in this conversation with the Father. Even the Son of Man doesn't even know. At least when he was on this earth, he didn't know from what we read from the Scriptures. So some of you may ask, well, why, why, why is he coming back anyways? I mean, he, why didn't he just stay here? Because it's going to be different than when he came the first time. The first time Jesus came, he came to deal with sin, 
What, what is he going to do the second time? He's going to rule the earth. That's why the writer of the book of Revelation, John, seeing the coming of Christ, wrote these famous words, Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. Daniel saw that. John saw that. The question is, do we see that? Look at verse 10 as we prepare to close this morning. The court was seated and the books were opened. I mean, isn't that kind of a frightening event? Revelation 20 says the same thing. And I saw that the books were open. There's all kinds of connections between Revelation and the second half of the book of Daniel. Do you know that God keeps a book? He has a book on everybody. And when he gets to your page in the book or your entry, he's looking for, and he already knows, but he's looking for a big canceled stamp across the page that your sin is canceled by the blood of Jesus Christ, your mediator. And I hope it's there. And for all of us who are followers of Jesus, we can have confidence that our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And so therefore, we need to know the gospel and embrace the gospel. We need to trust that what the Bible says is going to come to pass is going to come to pass. And we need to be ready. And we need to embrace the good news of the gospel, which is simply this. Jesus Christ came and he died on the cross for our sins so that we could have eternal life. And so that we wouldn't have to spend eternity separated from God, but rather we would spend eternity with God. Jesus came to save even those who are frankly his enemies. His love is not only unconditional, it's contra-conditional. He loves us despite of how we treat him, despite our nature. He came to forgive every one of us so that before the court is seated that day, before the books are open, he can step up and go, Father, Father, that one, that person's mine, that person's mine, that person's mine. That debt has been canceled. He or she, they belong to me. That's a decision that we need to be worried about. We don't need to worry about that much about the tribulation. We don't need to worry about understanding all these empires and, and being certain about every little thing. We need to be worried about one thing. Is Jesus Christ the Lord of our lives? Do we have a relationship with Jesus Christ? That's all we need to prepare ourselves for eternity. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you, Father God, that we can look at difficult passages and learn from them. We pray, Father God, that you, in the next couple of weeks, as we go through this more and more, that you would reveal to us more and more in knowledge. But help us, Lord God, to recognize that at the root, this is an issue of the heart. Our hearts should be longing for you, Father God. And if they aren't this morning, if for some reason our hearts are hard because we don't know you or because we haven't given ourselves fully to you, I pray that you would soften our hearts this morning. In your name we pray.